yeah, thanks for uh, doing the short notice. I was just like, fuck, man, I got to get a podcast out because I'm 230 weeks in a row and I haven't missed anything. But I've been in a fucking bad headspace lately. I talked about it last week so people will know. And uh, I'm not through that fucking storm yet. And it's uh, it's weird. It's been this wave of, um, I mean, it's literally grief. Even though a person is hasn't passed, when you cut someone out of your life. A relationship has ended. Yeah, dude. And so uh, it's weird because something that I preach all the time is like seasons of life. And once people don't serve you, sometimes you have to move past those people. And uh, it that's an easy thing to say on a podcast. And it's an easy thing to do once somebody who is in your life, you realize like, ah, you know what? I'm, I'm better off without that person or that person's bringing me down. But when it's people that you actually still love and cherish and it's simply an incident that kind of different things kind of came to a head and you, you go your separate ways, bro, it's a different thing. And yeah. so like I would say I was overcome with a lot of sadness for a week and then it went into like fucking rage for a while. <laughs> and I was like, you know what, dude? I've been on this fucking journey for the last, I mean, I talked to you and Will a little bit about it. I've been on this journey of like trying to find peace and love and fucking like chasing like the best version of myself. There's a part of me that just wants to go back to saying, fuck everything. Like that person, even though that person probably wasn't the happiest version of myself, navigating the world with a fuck everything mentality can actually be easier, you know? And, uh, I don't know. I feel like that was an easy way to navigate in our 20s because we were both pretty reckless in our 20s. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, you know? it, changing kid or changing, having kids changes everything because then you have skin in the game and you have a stake in the future. And yeah, when, when you're 20 years old, really what it was, it was an excuse not to be responsible and just say, ah, oh, fuck it. I don't care. Yeah. But I mean, our fuck it, I don't care meant volunteering for multiple combat deployments over and over and over and over and over. I think there's more to that. I, I like, I enjoyed it. it I enjoyed ex- it. It too. was exciting. Oh, it was don't an yeah, adventure. Yeah. We were, we were kind of living, you know, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a cowboy. Yeah. So that was the 2005 version. But I do think that there's a correlation between living kind of reckless and that lifestyle that we chose because a lot of people, um, uh, even in their 20s, they wouldn't have been able to like settle into that op tempo and being gone nine months a year and confronting dangerous shit all the time. And, uh, but no, you're right, bro. Every time I talk about this, <laughs> and, I tell and people. We all have trouble integrating into uh, suburbia with a, a picket fence and 2.5 kids. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And that's something that me and Jenny have been talking a lot about in the last couple of weeks because she's like, dude, you've never lived a normal life, you know? And, uh, you've kind of, you've been on this journey and now your journey just took another kind of unexpected turn and fuck man, that's, that's just kind of how we live. And I know you went through some massive life changes with a divorce and a new house and moving to a new area and all that shit. And it's kind of like, I just have to be accepting and comfortable knowing like, fuck the show's called the endless endeavor. Yeah. Like, what does tomorrow bring? <laughs> Who really fucking knows? Yeah. And we can focus on our businesses and our fitness and our camaraderie between our friends and all the shit that like makes tomorrow be a better tomorrow, most likely. But the the other side of that is you just never fucking know, man. Mm-hmm. And I'm I'm kinda I'm kind of in a phase right now where there's a little bit of unknowns. And it's not like you know, financially, the business, my marriage, like the the foundation of who I am is going to be fine. Mm-hmm. And so I know I'll be able to keep moving forward. But, uh, you know, people know on the show that the boys are like my sons. That's what I've always looked at them as. And this family dynamic that shifted, it's yet to be determined where we all fall. And, you know, one thing that I've noticed through this process is when there's unknowns, do you know what, at least what my mind does? It starts to go down all these what if rabbit holes. Yeah, worst case scenario. Worst case scenario. Because, what if, what if well, we never on. work it out and I never and this I never, is, never have a relationship a again? I had just the other the other day is all of us, especially the military guys, we're good at making worst case scenario plans. We've been trained to do that, and a lot of people have some sort of like 
mitigation. If you have a first aid kit in your house, you have some sort of worst case scenario plan to some degree. Yes. How many people have ever sat down and written out a plan for their best case scenario? And actually like, this is the best case scenario. Here's a plan to make it happen. Yeah. I, no, I, and that's, I, has, I've never heard of anyone doing that. Yeah. And is that, is that, do we, do we look at the outcome of situations being doomsday almost to a fault? Yeah, I, because I'm we, starting to think so. We have always preached preparedness, resilience, defiance, like becoming strong and capable. And, and I mean, as you're saying that, you just bought this new rifle that can hit somebody at 2,500 meters. So, like, you know, <laughs> which we'll get into next because I actually right. want to kind of geek out on the long range stuff, right. unpack our, our trip that we did with Tony Cowden a little bit. But, uh, yeah, it's easy to always look at worst case scenarios. And yeah. bro, like, and I don't know how your brain it's, works. It's probably some social programming that has been entered, certainly entered into us through the military and probably even before. Yeah. And there is somewhere in there is some middle ground because it is good to have some provisions and whatnot. And be like, you do, you should have a first aid kit in your house, right? Because, because accidents happen. Um, but not to get stuck completely into that mindset and also have a plan for your best case scenarios. Yeah. And be working through that plan, even even if provisions for the other way are, are in place. Well, and you know, like I say on the show very often, informed but not consumed, I think that would, best case scenario, try and apply that to preparedness as well. Yeah. Like, should we have some water? Probably. Mm -hmm. You know, do we have fucking, we probably have four months of food, freeze-dried food for the family and rice and shit and all that stuff that I've talked about on the podcast at nauseum. I, I'll never think that that is a bad idea, right? Because at the end of the day, like, hey, 20, 35 hits and, and nothing's happened yet. Hey, guess what we're eating for yeah, the next we're having, six We're months. having a lot of chicken and tacos. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I going through this, I'm, I'm feeling all these different emotions. And uh, what my brain does when I'm stressed about anything is I just don't sleep. And I fucking hate that. And I... I I always fall asleep okay, and I usually go to bed at between 10 and 11, and then 132 hits, boom, eyes are wide open, yep. and I'm up the rest of the fucking night. Yes. I might get another hour from like 5 to 6, but dude, that's such a, that's just such shit sleep, and that's been me for the last couple of weeks now. Another reason I didn't want to have some fucking political candidate in here you know it's just no, like no yes. i just want to sit down with my ranger buddy if my brain's not working right nope. he's fucking seen me <laughs> droning plenty between, of times between the two of this of us we can manage three quarter of a brain <laughs> yeah and so man at night i'm thinking about things because it's like i don't want to look at my phone because then the blue light goes in your brain and then there's zero chance of going back asleep. Also, it's once you realize man i more and more i have realized that this little black box we all carry around in our pocket is a tool for social programming. And I don't even know, like you, you cannot know what to believe anymore. Even the people who say X is the one place where it's actually for, how do you know? Like, how well, do you actually know? Well, and 48% of Americans think that now X is propaganda on the other side. Yeah, it might when, and, and we it, felt it was it propaganda against our beliefs for the last four years. And uh, again, I want to get into that too, because I've, I've been wondering, like, <sighs> I guess no, my, we'll my, get into my, that. my point is yeah. with the midnight scrolling is I've almost completely eliminated any, I'll, I'll, I'll cruise through X a little bit to try to look for some news headlines. Yeah. And other than that, dude, I've, I've turned off all the social media because the more I look at it, the more I realize it's all social programming, no matter how independently sort like you think you found like the four people who are independents and it's like eh, and it's people there's... that people that we trust like i trust elon musk or i trust joe rogan and it's and that's true there's certain men that i i consume their content that i have trust for but at the end of the but day where are they get really where know. are they getting their information you don't really too? know at the end of the day. you know um and so that that zooming out and once you observe how kind of crooked and twisted it all is it it just kind of grosses me out. So I, it almost, the problem almost took care of itself. Yeah. No. So it's like when, once you're, once you're just kind of lost in your own thoughts, mm -hmm. when you're not in a good headspace, bro, I'm here to tell you it gets dark fast again. Yeah. And yeah. I haven't been a dark person in a long time mm -hmm. where it's like, you know what, dude, 
Never mind. I, I probably shouldn't say some of the thoughts that have been going through my head the last yeah. couple of nights. But then I listened to a book called The Four Agreements. Have you listened to that book? I have not. And so there was two things. I, I finished it on the flight down to uh, Tahoe. I was down there for Sheely's wedding last weekend. And the last two talk or the, the middle two talking points, the four agreements, it's basically four talking points to being the best version of yourself. And it was uh, the second one is don't take anything personal. And it's easier said than done, right? Oh, because yeah. everything's against you. Well, this person said this, this person said that. Yeah. And it's like, dude, some, some members of my family have said, Hey, I'm going to take, I'm going to take a break from us based on some of the shit that's played out over the last couple weeks. I'm going to take a break. Taking a, And it was even phrased nicely. I got the text message. I can show you. It's like, Hey, that's the way in which it was articulated to me was as nice as it could be. Right. But bro, once your head's spinning at three in the morning and you're thinking about all these different what ifs, yeah. what, what if, what if he's taking a break because of this? What if, what if somebody told them the story wrong? What if this, what if that, what if, and, and then you start to like, it's hard to know what's true and what's imagination. Yes. At that point. And so now I'm taking everything personally because I feel like, Oh, it's, it's everybody against me. No, so no, no. It's, everybody against me is a story that I'm telling myself yes. because I'm miserable because I can't sleep yes. and discerning stories from truth is like one of the real tricks that, that I've learned over the last two years doing all of the, uh, like the plant medicine path to, yeah. to deal with post-traumatic stress. Um, as it, it ties right back to understanding how much social programming comes out of your, your iPhone is understanding what is authentically true to you in your own, in your own experience of reality, as opposed to what is a story that's either coming from your imagination or from someone else's imagination, which is the little black box in your hand. Yeah. And bro, I haven't sat down with anyone yet either. This has all just been, everything just kind of came out over a handful of text messages. And yeah. bro, that's the worst. Uh, that, that's that's another the worst. Thing. Text message should not be used for deep conversation. And, I, and I'm as guilty as anyone because I, I sent some fucking text messages and said some shit. And it's like, whew, fuck bro, how long do you have to fucking be on planet earth before you realize that like inflection and context and all that stuff can get misconstrued. Yeah. Oh, yes. And then, uh, and then the one, uh, the next rule from the uh, four agreements is don't make assumptions. <laughs> so those two just yeah. tie right in together yeah. because I think, and texting requires a lot of assuming tons of assumptions, no body man. Language, right? And so it's, uh, yeah, fuck man. My brain has just been on this fucking roller coaster and it's, uh, it's, it's a weird place to arrive at because I would say for the last 24 months, it's been the most stability that I've ever had in my life. Financially, emotionally, um, my house, like between me and Jenny and like, don't get me wrong. Life happens. We've had some fucking ups and downs throughout that. Yeah. But, and, but overall, and maybe, maybe you arrived at a point of stability where a shakeup that needed to happen could. And that's exactly without, where I'm going with this. dropping the house on it. Yes. I think, uh, you know, for, for people that are into astrology, um, the, the, this cycle of these people coming into my life and then these people leaving my life was seven years to the day. Oh, interesting. To the day. Yeah. Like, and uh, some of my friends wrote me, and it's like, hey, this this is like, my friend Carrie brought this up to Jenny. It's like, hey, there's this astrology cycle that's seven years, blah, blah, blah. And sometimes, and she like tied in, um, I don't know if Carrie did or Jenny did, but they tied into the like, me being a Libra and this going into this new phase. They said these things, and then I went back and looked. Because, you know, everything's fucking marked on social media now. Oh, and, yeah. and uh, yeah, you're right. bro, seven years to the day. Huh. And it's like, that's exactly what I'm thinking is like, dude, I think, not that I was too comfortable, but your life needed to be fucking shaken up, and you needed to fucking kind of change the trajectory of your ship because there's something different out there that you need to, like, if, if everything's good, it's kind of like uh, like Tony Robbins says, if you want to take the beach, burn the boats, right? Yeah. Like if you're smooth sailing and you're, you're financially comfortable and you, your relationship feels comfortable, you're not really incentivized 
to go out there and fucking like what's next. Yeah. Also movement is required for life and for reality to exist. So at, at the point you stop moving, you've basically stopped dying at, at like the micro level. And this is like a macro level. Like your, your life has to continue to evolve. It's not always going to be fun and easy. Yeah. And so I have to take my own advice and just be like, Hey, fuck it. <laughs> Yeah. The, the fucking micro sometimes Suck you microdose adversity and then sometimes you fucking macrodose adversity but uh it's it's strange to me how even after going through a lot of different things emotionally over the last i would say decade for us because 10 years ago we were still pretty shut off to the world oh fuck dude two years ago two years ago yeah yeah um in fact when we did the uh the first uh, or Whatever the first time we sat down on this show was. Yeah, because we've, we've been four years on the show now, dude. Yeah. Isn't that fucking crazy? Yeah, yeah, that is. And so, yeah, that's, uh, I always, uh, one one reason I think the show does fairly well is I just, like, fucking talk about my real life. And I try and put it out there in the most authentic manner possible. But also, with with this current situation. I don't want to put anybody's fucking dirty laundry out there, including my own. So I'm kind of skirting the issues. And if, if that's not enough information for you guys too fucking yeah, bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, the one thing I did want to talk about, or, or I should say another thing is and geeking out on long range. Uh, yeah. I think, um, just ordered a rifle yesterday. What did you get? I ordered a Bergara crest in uh, seven PRC. That's the the link that you sent me, right? With yes. that like uh, composite stock. That's f- yep. Yep. Okay. And I I bought the steel barrel just because three three quarters of a pound was not worth another seven hundred dollars. Well, then I wanted to, if you know, um, a carbon fiber barrels are kind of uh, I know Christensen Arms kind of came on the scene. I don't know if they were the first to do it, but they're the they were the first where I like heard about it mainstream. And there was always something, and it's just the old ranger in me that's like, is that, is that really as good? Is that even possible? It, it sounds strange. I'm about to find out. Um, Courtney Fleming, our friend from uh, Benchmark Barrels in Arlington. So she was on our, so you guys, if you want to listen to Courtney, she was just on the Enlightened Neanderthals podcast, which is me and Jordan and Mike talking about carbon fiber barrels. Okay. And so she well, describes- good. You can just- fucking regurgitate everything <laughs> yeah no no she was she was describing the whole manufacturing process and how they do it um but it, it does sound like they are legit but like i said it was it was going to save me three quarters of a pound at a price tag of seven hundred dollars on this gun to to get a carbon barrel and i just thought nah yeah i can just fucking hump an extra pound and yep. be okay yeah well and the although thing- i will say that as i'm getting more and more into hunting the things i will pay for are warmth comfort and lightweight yeah. Those, I, I have budget for those three items. Well, and I mean, I think we've earned that too. Yeah. <laughs> because we had a whole fucking, our youth didn't, yeah. we didn't get to enjoy any of those yeah. things. Well, even three years ago, I had the mentality of, hey, whatever shit I got in the closet is what I'm using and I can just be stronger. Yeah. And, yeah. and then over the last couple of years, it's like, no, I'm, I'm getting good equipment. This yeah. Is, this sucks. And my fucking knees are starting to go out again. So. Oh, fuck. Although I got on BioPro and I felt good this last couple of weeks, so. That was a that wasn't a mid roll ad. That's just the fucking truth. Oh yeah. But uh, yeah, that's the truth. Like fucking having nice equipment changes the experience. It does, and not everything has to just be fucking kick your dick in yeah. hardness training. Because yeah. if you go hunting and you get an animal, the as I found out last month, the hardness training is going to be inevitable. Mm-hmm. I had to carry that fucking, and it was a little deer. Yeah. It was a, a yearling button buck, and it was uh, probably maybe just over 100 pounds. Mm-hmm. And it was funny because, I mean, it's the internet, so anytime you post something, it's like, well, it's not a very big deer. Someone said something about it, and it's <laughs> like, well, it's all relative. Yeah. I probably carried that thing a mile up a hill. Yeah. And, <laughs> bro, like, you know how, like, you get uh they call it Fran Long and CrossFit, but it's exercised induced pulmonary edema where you're oh, breathing right. so hard you can taste blood going yes. down your throat. Yes. I got that. Oh, shit. And I hadn't had that from exercise in a really long time. And, uh, but the thing is, like, because it was an experience, because I, well, I had a, I had a bad shot placement and it made me have to track this animal for like fucking two and a half hours, way, way down in this gulch. Yeah. And, uh, 
the other hunters I was with was even saying, bro, it's probably time to pull it. You know, it's mm-hmm. like, it's, it's not looking good, but I bumped it a couple of times and I could tell it was injured. Mm-hmm. And there was a part of me that's just like, dude, I owe that animal yeah, everything this. I fucking have to see this through Yep, because we all know what's going to happen. He's going to get ripped apart by coyotes. Yep. His leg was fucked up. And then, and bro, it took me three arrows to kill this deer. Holy shit. And the last one was on the move. I bumped it another time. But the, the, the cool thing about shooting an injured animal is like ethical shot placement is now out the window. It's like, I can just center mass, it, center. bro. It's just like a, a ready up, you yeah. know, it's a yeah, ready yeah, up yeah. with my bow. Yep. And, uh, Thank God. And I honestly think, because you and I did ready-up drills. For people that don't know what those are, ready-up drills is you have your rifle at the at the low ready or the high ready, and you just put a little piece of tape on the wall, and you do you can do movement drills and, like, face towards your target and then bring your weapon up on target, flip your safety, and just get lots of repetitions doing a ready-up. Part of being a ranger was... And correct me if I'm wrong, wasn't it 30 minutes every morning? Oh, God, I think it was more than that. I mean, it was PT, draw your weapon, ready up drills until chow. Yeah. And we were saw gunners for a portion of our career, too. Yeah. And that doesn't matter. Strong ass left shoulder. <laughs> yeah. I honestly think all of those fucking ready up drills, because I've hit two deer on the move now. Have you? As a new archer. Just pull your bow up and yeah. send it. And yeah. I'm not, um, I don't train a ton on my bow. Mm-hmm. But marksmanship and like just it, movement drills. And, it might and, be that that uh, what do they call it? That oh 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 d loop or OOD, 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 OOD loop. There it is. Yeah. Um, that you just have the observe, the, orient, decide, act. Is that the OOD loop? Yeah. I okay. wonder if yours is more finely in tuned to hey, I acknowledging a a good sight picture and then releasing. Well, I mean, I would hope so. Yeah. <laughs> if, <laughs> you know what I mean? As, yeah, as yeah. soon as you see those pins on target, you're, you're letting go. Yeah. And uh, you haven't That's, shot bow so much, So when, right? when I teach people to shoot carbine out at the, the range for my classes... That's, that's one of the hardest things for them to get over... Is when I tell them to just thumb off the safety... And fire the shot on instinct at like close range, just using their thumb to point. They cannot get over... It, it's really... It takes them a lot of reps before they get over the hump of not... Pulling the gun up, confirming they see the sights, confirming it's a good sight picture, and then a second and a half, two seconds later, pulling the trigger. Yeah. Well, and like like Lappin teaches on guns and geese range, if you wait for the perfect sight picture, mm-hmm. it never happens. Yeah. You don't need a perfect sight picture. You need good enough. Yeah. Right? So he does that sign of the cross drill where you purposefully shoot, you intentionally shoot with poor sight pictures to show that... In close ranges, impact is still pretty damn fucking good yeah. with shitty sight pictures. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's that exact same concept. Yeah. And so, yeah, for sure. I, it, the, and I can almost, and this lets me know that I'm becoming a better hunter because the first few deer I killed, it was fucking heart beating out of my chest. Like, put an arrow through it. What, what direction did he run? Oh, fuck, dude. Uh, <laughs> uh, kind of this way, I think. Yeah. And it's almost like there's a, a, a lapse in time. Cause it's like, well, did you see where I heard this a lot? Did you see where your arrow impacted the animal? I barely even remember anything after releasing the arrow. Right. Yeah, yeah. And the last two deer on this trip, I started to feel like dialed in on those different aspects. And like, as I close my eyes now, I can visually remember the, cause the sight picture on my bow, they're like, they have the fiber optics. So they, they glow. Mm-hmm. And I can remember it center mass and fucking releasing that arrow. Yeah. You know? Cool. And then the last deer that I killed was perfect shot placement. The deer died within 30 yards of where it stood. And uh, it was a six point buck. And it was not our last night, but the night before. And uh, that was just a cool experience. And it was sad. Don't get me wrong. Like, I, I still feel sad watching these animals die. And I think that that's a natural process that we're supposed to feel, but also like a sense of relief that it's like, oh dude, everything came together. I felt calm when I, when I drew my bow back, I had a good sight picture and you know how, just like with a firearm, you don't have to wait for the ding to know if you had a good shot or not. Yeah. Yeah. You know, right when you release. Yeah. Your fundamentals, if you've put enough time with, with rifles or archery, 
your fundamentals are honed enough to where you don't have to look at your target to know if it was a good shot or not. And the second I really said it, I was like, yes. <laughs> just <laughs> That was the one. And that was the one. Yep. And sure as shit it was, man. But uh, I already talked about archery on the podcast. I want to, and we don't have to go down like this giant rabbit hole of long range, but I think it would be interesting to kind of. We're, we're both white belts at it anyway. That's, that's so, right. So yeah, really yeah. talk about the stoke and whatnot. But yeah. I, I think, and that's exactly what I wanted to talk about is like, People have this misconception because we were rangers that were like black belt level on every weapon yeah, system. We, we do have the fundamentals of marksmanship down. I've noticed that like the understanding what a, what a good sight picture is for one that that's a hard message to relay to people too. Like the consistency and the sort of the neuroses of everything being exactly the fucking same over and over again. And then just the reps on a trigger, any trigger to get over people got to get over the hump of flinching, like, you know what I mean? And the uh, practice of shooting with two eyes open. So we have a lot of reps on basic marksmanship, which is a really good foundation. If you're then, cause, cause getting into precision shooting now, now we're, we're chasing higher level um, skill sets. Yeah. So having that basic level marksmanship already mastered, I think is a, is, is a good or a, is a big step forward. And it was just kind of by chance you were you were planning on going like originally, right? Or did it yeah. kind of get sprung on you too? No, Tony was out here teaching his uh, his class on our range, and so he and I had hit it off. And he said, "Come out to Montana and do the long range course." And I said, "Oh, perfect!" All yeah. Right. <laughs> Jordan Jordan was sitting right there. He's like, "You come too, bro." And he's like, "Okay." And then Jordan didn't go. <laughs> yeah, I heard I heard Jordan said okay, and then bitched out. Yeah, I don't yeah. know if that's an accurate story. You, you or can not. talk to him about it when you get him in here to talk about Chris Russell. <laughs> But yeah, then you hit me up and say, hey, Tony invited us out. And for those that don't know, Tony Cowden, um, you can hear his story on the Sean Ryan podcast. He's done my podcast as well, but just a really fascinating human being. High energy, likes to talk, but, but you know, some people like to talk and it annoys you. And then he, some people like to talk and it captivates you. He doesn't carry a big ego. No. Yeah, you're right. Is what it is. He and just, so he, he relates well to people. And he is kind of like a life of the party kind of guy. Yes. With an absolute black belt level of knowledge in all kinds of different aspects of shooting. He, he must have like an encyclopedic memory. Yeah. It, what his, his memory is unusual. Well, and something that's really fascinating about him too is like, like he's like a grandmaster in Ipsic. So like the, the sport side of shooting, the competitive side of shooting and then he's also had some of the gnarliest combat engagements that any of us have ever heard of, mm -hmm. where he's shot 40 dudes in a day, ian -E solo, like really, really wild fucking, the shit you see in Hollywood. Yeah. And that's what I think on uh, on Sean Ryan's show, they were saying like the real life John Wick, right? Because it is. Oh, is that right? it, I mean, the <laughs> shit he's done. Yeah, he's, he's as close as they get. He's as close as they get. To be able to have to be an absolute expert in both the civilian side of the house and the tactical side of the house, and then be able to marry those together. That's why out on the range, you can tell dude, he is there to have fun yes. and impart knowledge on you. Yes. That's what he wants to do. Yep. And he even says, he's like, guys, like anytime you go to the range and some guy starts barking at you and saying, Hey, hurry the fuck up and get on the shooting line. He's like, I think they forget that. Like, uh, I work for you. <laughs> like you paid me to be out here. So, yeah. uh, like, I don't understand how I can be working for you. You hired me for a job, and then I get to bark at you? He goes, that's fucking ridiculous, man. <laughs> and it's like, I love, I just love that vibe, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so, yeah, he said, hey, come out to Montana. And we, we kind of joked because we bought our Remington 700s, I think, in 2001. Yeah, 25 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and, dude, remember, we took it out, and we were shooting them. I had that old Mercury Topaz yeah. and we even shot like off the roof of that car off the, I off think. the fucking, Did we get uh, yelled at for being out on Fort Lewis. Is that what you're, is that where you're going with uh, this? Yeah. I remember it being a problem. I don't remember if we got in trouble on the spot or if afterwards someone was like, what the fuck are you doing? Yeah, I don't know. But it was funny because that gun then s literally sat in my safe for the better part of 25 years. Yeah. I took it hunting one or two times mm -hmm. and just basically confirmed zero, but I treated that weapon like an M4. I yeah. zeroed it a hundred yards and I didn't understand how that weapon worked whatsoever. And so when you said, Hey, Tony wants us to come out with them. I'm like, dude, this is some, this is not only an opportunity to learn a skill set, but also opportunity to 
grow the network, meet some new people. And sure as shit, we met fucking some cool people that weekend. But to be able to now like link my gun to my Kestrel and program everything and fucking measure the muzzle velocity and, and like input all the data. And then like, dude, we only shot, it was a two day course, right? Two days, two days, two long days. By the end of day two, if Tony's like, all right, 750 yard target right here, engage. And it's like, okay, uh, and put it in the Kestrel. And, uh, also I have a nicer scope now from Vortex that was like, it's an MRAD. So it's set up in mills and you can, the, the Kestrel will literally read like six mils up and, and one and a half, right. Click, 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 bang, ding. It's like, Oh fuck, dude, <laughs> yeah. this shit actually works. Yeah. But with that said, there's a lot of fucking like math and confusion. You remember when he he had that Ipsic target that he was writing out the oh, yeah. uh yes. What was what what uh, did I he remember. I forget the term that he used, but my brain just couldn't grasp it. And I was like, Tony, I know I might be the most retarded people person <laughs> here, but I'm I just there's something fucking missing in my brain. I can't connect the dots and he was just like, "Well, listen." And and he explained it again. And I remember, remember I had to ask him like two or three times. Yeah, I'm like, bro, yeah, it's still, not, still not yeah. sinking in. And then there was, uh, um, fuck, I'm drawing a blank. Who's the guy that was out here last weekend? Uh, Adam. Adam. Adam's boys. Ricky said, uh, yeah, it's not, it's not sinking in for me either. And he's a smart kid. Yeah. And I was like, oh, yes, we're, we're in this together, Ricky. <laughs> and then it finally did. Right. But, the, but my point is there's a lot that fucking goes into this dude. Yeah, that it was not. So that's that's why it's important to have that base in marksmanship hammered out first, because it was not a lot of time on the guns. It was a lot of time learning how to use the kestrel and learning about the actual ballistics of uh, of the rounds. Yeah, and and if anyone's not familiar with what a kestrel is, think of a GPS that can also measure like air density, moisture, even wind. It has a little fucking fan on it that does yeah, wind it's reading. Like all your atmospherics. Yep, and then you input. All of the all of the hard data, the the twist rate of your barrel, the length of your barrel, the caliber of the bullet, uh, the grain of the bullet, and you put in basically everything that is hard data, and then it calculates everything for you. And yeah. It's fucking fascinating. Yeah, it's dude. pretty goddamn spot on with you. Yeah, and then you have to have someone who really knows their shit to call wind. Yeah, because that's an art that uh, I don't know that the computer will ever be able. Do. And I'm not that guy. I'm, not, yeah. <laughs> and I probably never will be if yeah. we're being honest. But uh, and, and Tony even said he went through um, special forces sniper school in 1999, mm-hmm. and he said everything I'm teaching you today is literally has nothing to do with what we learned in '99. He's like oh. the the everything has advanced so far, and there's so much more technology available now. That like it's it's almost a different activity at this rate. Yeah, I think I think he did say too that back about that time frame, six to seven hundred yards was considered sniper territory because it was the M twenty four, you know, three hundred eight yeah. gun. Yep. And now that's almost automatic with these new rifles. That, yeah, that, I mean, that's like shooting an M four at hundred. Yeah. Uh, uh, my fucking wife could probably be hitting six hundred after one day of Tony Cowden's course. Yeah. You know. Mm-hmm. Um. So, and I don't know if I told you this or not yet, but Vortex said, mount those scopes on your guns that they just sent us. So like I was using a a Viper out there. Same. And then Vortex just sent us the razors. Mm -hmm. And it was funny Mm -hmm. too, man, because I I was out there, I went and had dinner with Seamus and he's like, great, tell me what you need, man. You're part of the pro team. You need to be running our latest, greatest stuff. That's part, we want it in your hands. It's not just like, Hey, we're taking care of you because you're part of the pro team. He's like, that's part of what we want. People seeing you running our latest, greatest gear. Yeah. And I was like, even though I understand my position with you guys, there's still something inside of me that I just, it hurts to, to send an email and be like, Hey, can you send me this, this, and this? Oh yeah. Cause you still have humility. Yeah, dude. And it's <laughs> like, it's good, bro. They have sent so much stuff to us over the last few years. Yeah. And so I, he goes, if you don't, send a request list you're going to force me to guess and if that's what you want then that's what you get and i was like okay listen we're getting into long range precision we're having fun with it i think it's something that i'm going to geek out on a little bit anything that you think would benefit that 
mission yeah. and, want, and if Vortex wants to support that mission, it's much appreciated. And they sent us each one of the new razors and uh, that fucking scope is sick, dude. It's pretty dope. And so what what I would like to do, and Seamus even said it, get get those scopes mounted, get everything dialed in, and then we'll go out there and do some long range shooting with their long distance team. And then they're going to mount the impacts on top of our scopes. Ooh. Do you know what those are? That is that the range finder that Tony had on? Yeah, the front so li- well, it's also it's also its own ballistic calculator too. Yes. And when we were out to dinner, when they said that, he's, uh, I said, well, it's interesting you said you're saying this because I literally just learned all about a ballistic calculator with the Kestrel, and uh, and their long range instructor was out to dinner with us. We all went and ate fucking steak and drank a bunch of wine before I went sober, and. Uh, he goes, dude, the Kestrel is a great piece of equipment, but the impact is just very different. So if you want to like... It's another piece of equipment you have to go learn. Yes. Yeah, so instead of sending the impact in the box with the scopes, it's come out and our team oh, will teach you how to, to put use it them. on. And, and Yeah. Exactly. Oh, dude, so that'll be a fun fucking trip, yeah, dude. Yeah. And uh, you haven't been out there yet, uh-uh. but it's, it's pretty fascinating. We'll do another tour of the facility mm-hmm. and... Uh, Every, every day is bring your dog to work day at Vortex. So there's like 50 dogs running around the office <laughs> at any given time, dude. Not like chaos, that you know is, what I mean? But okay. it's, uh, you know. Say, your house has like two dogs running around and it's chaos. Well, three now because I, I just oh, got that right. new Malinois. Who's the coolest fucking dog in the world, man. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it, I think in another thing that Tony does when it comes to long distance shooting, he's like, Guys, we're not learning to be snipers, preparing for the apocalypse. He's like, let's just learn to feed our families better. Yeah. And he goes, my whole job in teaching you guys how to be long-range shooters is to help you learn the distance in which you can make an ethical shot placement on an animal. Yeah, that was my, when he went around and asked, what is your goal for the course? Mine was, I want to kill shot on a mule deer at 600 yards. That, mm-hmm. that was my course objective. And you're... You're there now, right? Would yeah. you take that shot right uh, now? You think? No, I think my longest when we went out last month, my my, I told Mike and Jordan, I said my longest shot will be 400. Yeah, and that's if there's no wind. Well, and remember at the end of the course, he went around and he said, because w- what do people always say when it comes to either shooting an animal or a person? They're like, well, this rifle can can shoot out to 2,000 meters, and then this bullet can sh- is better for and like. Everybody's always talking about the equipment and Tony's like, and, and while there is validity to that, the most important part of the puzzle is you. Yeah. And he's like, so at the, at the conclusion of this course, he went around and he's like, what, what range are you comfortable shooting an animal at after attending this course? And even though I was hitting steel, I mean, we hit steel out to a thousand. Mm-hmm. If I was to shoot an elk, I told him like, ah, probably 300 just because Again, learning a lot of those lessons through archery, shooting targets and shooting animals, two different things. Mm-hmm. And then Tony goes, based on how I've watched you shoot all weekend, I, I think you should be comfortable out to about 450. Mm-hmm. And it's like, that gives you a confidence boost. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, and, and it gave me a goal now for next year. So with this new rifle I've got coming chambered in 7PRC, and I've worked out a way out at our, our range out there in Granite Falls to shoot out to 1,000 yards. Um, my goal for next hunting season is to be comfortable on that same kill zone shot out to 700. Okay. And, and, and that gives me something just, just to have a hobby and something to work on. Yeah. And then the other cool thing that was really, really focused on that weekend was not because what do people think when they think of long range shooting, they think of being in the prone, being behind, being behind glass and like, you know, breath control, oh, trigger yeah. control, and, all the stuff. And the way it works out at our place, you have to shoot in rough terrain. So it's using like a frame backpack to yeah. support yourself. All, all these goofy sort of offhand supported positions. And and that was like, that was half of the course. Yeah. He's like, how to employ your tripod quickly and effectively. Yeah. How to shoot off of a fence, how to shoot off of a backpack. Yeah. And then that last drill, it's like, all right, I think it was like five different shooting positions where he's like, all right, we're going to shoot off the fence. Then we're going to shoot off a tire. Then you got to mount it to your tripod. No, the tripod was first. Yes. And then fence and then tire. 
and then prone and just like going through different shooting positions. Yeah. And we had two minutes to do it. So it's yeah. like, oh, a little bit of stress behind it too. Yeah. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I can't complete this drill. It's just giving me anxiety. <laughs> that's oh, a little, no. yeah, we, we uh, that's a little yeah. personal joke. We'll keep that between me and folk. Um, but yeah, uh, on that, if a two minute drill gives you too much anxiety to complete, like probably got to hit the CrossFit gym or something. Yeah. Yeah. But dude, it was, uh, when that was all said and done, I felt like I probably obtained as much knowledge as I could have in a two oh, day. for two days, in yeah. A, it, it, it was honestly overload because I just sat down with the Kestrel before elk season and I had to pull out the instruction manual. So I was like, I forgot all of the programming. I took notes, luckily. Did you? Yeah, yeah. No, that is definitely one of those courses where it's like you're drinking from the fire hose. Mm-hmm. And my brain doesn't retain stuff very well yeah. anyways, especially when you're consuming it at that rate. Yep. And so I got all my notes still. And that's, uh, it's funny because I bought that Kestrel like the next the next weekend. Yeah, I wish. It's yeah. still in the box. Oh, is it? <laughs> yeah. I'd say the real advantage of going back again is now going to be that I'll get my Kestrel programmed with my gun. Yeah. And then, uh, and then Tony told us a couple other things like, oh, I'd, I'd switch these bipods out to these ones and yeah. I would switch your trigger out to a Timney trigger, which again is also in my safe, mm-hmm. not installed yet, but just some pro tips that he thinks will overall make you a better shooter. Yeah. Courtney actually gave me a, uh, she said, because we have the older Remington 700s, those triggers are good. They just need a little lightning. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, so you, you could keep that for another gun. Okay. And, and it's funny because, like, there's a part of me that's like, it's I need a new gun. Oh, yeah. But do I need it? That fucking 700, if I can consistently hit out at 800 yards, yeah, just what depend- do I need a what, new gun yeah, for? What are you going to use it for? Because if you're bow hunting, then no, you don't need a new gun. Unless unless you're deciding that you're going to do some hunting, then, then you yeah. base that decision on what you want to do with it. And you know what's funny? Like, once I became a hunter... I've realized like people want to hunt with you. Once they realize you're a hunter and you, you meet at a whatever and you get along, it's like, like literally at Sheely's wedding, I planned a moose hunt with a guy. Oh no shit. Yeah. He's like, dude, I'm going to, within three minutes of meeting each other, I think Brian even like broke the ice. It's like, you guys both like shooting animals with arrows. Like you probably like it. <laughs> Something like that. Right. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, it was literally hunting whitetail this time last week or whatever. And he goes, oh, dude, I just put a moose down. And he showed me the picture. Archery? Yeah, archery. And so what they do is uh, they do a float hunt where they drive like seven hours out in the middle of fucking nowhere. And, bro, I think he said the entire state of Alaska's population is like 700,000 or something. Like, we don't realize how remote, how empty, it gets. how empty it is. He's like, dude, you drive for like seven hours and you bring a boat and then you float. They call it like a, a four, 40 mile river or something. And you float this river for 40 miles while you're moose hunting. Jesus. And he's like, I would love for you to come with me next year. And I was like, bro, Done. I know we just met, but you told me that. And it's, it's on, <laughs> in my opinion, it's like set in stone now. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then the last thing he said uh, before we flew home was yesterday or the day before. He goes, hey, you know what else you should do, bro, is bring your uh, bring your portable podcast equipment and we'll do like nightly recordings of the hunt as we go. That would be cool. So it's like just like that, right? But I've noticed it's like once people know you're a hunter, man, not only do people want to hunt with you, but there's so many opportunities to hunt that oh, the open up that, from uh, that this open discussion. up yeah and i'm almost i feel like i'm tapped out already if i'm doing one or two trips to hawaii a year and one trip to wisconsin a year not only am i getting enough meat but it's like how many more weeks a year can i just take away off my real life to go chase animals in the woods yeah I, i'm like i think i'm at capacity already Do you, hang on have you ever hunted in washington state no well i shouldn't <laughs> say no okay. uh, me and the boys no, me and the boys hunted Idaho one time, and then me and Darren Loth did a fucking deer hunt 15 years ago where we just... No idea what you were doing. No fucking idea what we were doing. Yep. And just slung my rifle, and he's like, uh, oh, my uncle lives outside of Republic, Washington, and we just go out there and walk through the woods. 
not understanding anything about animal movement, fucking scent, wind, nothing. Yeah. And you'll be surprised to hear, we didn't see one goddamn thing, <laughs> right? Yeah. But uh, it's probably better off because if we'd shot an animal, I don't even think I, I knew where to shoot an animal. Like yeah. where would, if you were to say, hey, Greg, where on the deer are you aiming at? body like yeah, I, don't, yeah. I don't fucking know you center know? mass sergeant. yeah center mass yeah. um but had we shot a deer then what yeah now what do i know how to gut it or quarter it or, or all the shit that you need to do to pack it out of the fucking mountains like i honestly feel like for the first time in my life i could go out on a hunt alone and do all that stuff now okay and it wouldn't look great you know how like uh i don't know if you filleted many fish but when you're out of practice filleting fish, oh yeah, it's it just not, looks like it's shit. not going to look like expert butchery. No, you're just hacking quarters up <laughs> to get them out of there before the so, fucking bears and mountain lions show up. I basically uh, cleaned and broke down and deboned my entire buck, and a lot of it's not pretty. The back straps are just kind of like fuck, man. Dude, I, my honest opinion is that venison, especially, is just taco meat. So don't you know what I mean? Just chop it all up or grind it all <laughs> well, up. And that's don't a, worry about that's the, the beauty of it is that when you're cleaning it, you have two bins. You have your, your steak bin mm. and then all your trimmings. And the more you fuck up the cuts, the bigger the trimmings bin gets. Yeah. And it all gets eaten anyway, so yeah. whatever. Yeah. But uh, um, are you, are you, you think you're going to primarily be a rifle hunter? Yeah, because I there's something about shooting rifles that I've always loved ever since I was a kid with a twenty two. And so I geek out on this, like this long range hunting is right up my alley. Um, and I really like, or sorry, long range hunting, long range shooting is right up my alley. And then I like turning hunting into like a little mini adventure by, by doing it both truck. And we did it kind of, we, we did it just like we ran our operations up in the Kunar Valley, honestly, uh -huh. this last uh, deer season where I don't think we ever stayed. I think we stayed in the same camp two nights, one time. And we were, we were either, you know, moving truck camp or backpacks on with, uh, uh, you know, backpacking gear headed up into the, the higher areas. Um, but, but I like, I like turning it into a little adventure that way so that it's not just set up camp, get out the booze, light a big fire. And it, it's more of like a party. You know what I mean? Like some people just hang out at camp with the big wall tent and it turns into a big party. Um, I think a lot of people... <clears throat> I think a lot of people's reason to go hunting is to escape from their wife yeah. and get the fuck out of their house. Yeah. Cause I, I just, obviously people don't just come straight out and say that, but when you, you listen to them telling their stories, it's like, Oh, the, the hunting is your escape. Yeah. Whereas like, don't get me wrong. It probably is an escape for me to a certain extent, just because you're away from the daily grind and you're in the oh, woods and all amazing. that. Yeah, there's no service. No after after eight days out there with no cell phone service. Yeah, and dude. No, it's so fucking weird to come back to to you know life. And plus, it feels right. At yes. least you know, like it feels, it feels like this is what we're supposed to do. Because that's what men have been doing since yeah. the beginning of time yeah. until a hundred years ago. Yeah, I'm not supposed to be sitting in traffic on I five. I'm supposed to be <laughs> creeping around in the woods looking for something to eat. Te also, teaching your son how to do it. Yeah, right. Like, yeah. like that's literally <laughs> the most primal part of that. Is like, dude, not only am I fucking feeding my family, but I'm 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 basically like ensuring success generationally, yeah. teaching my fucking boys out there. Yeah. And dude, you told me that like fucking uh, Nathan puts the backpack on and just fucking trucks dude, along and fucking gets after it with you. It's cool, man. It is cool. And I was, it, this was another stoner thought I had the other night, which is that, you know, sometimes he'll come home with like a bad report card or something. And I start to get kind of like, God damn it. What the fuck? But it, you got to remember that some kids just don't do well in school. And all of these things that people think of as like vacation or fuck off, like my kid knows how to, uh, you know, start a fire. He knows how to make fire starter before we ever leave and, you know, do the cotton balls and Vaseline and pack it into little film cans and then put that in his backpack and make sure he also has Flint and he knows how to do all this stuff before we ever leave the house. Then he knows how to do all this stuff out in the woods. Like he'd be fine if he got separated from us for a couple of mm -hmm. days. He, he'd be scared, but he'd make it because he knows how to start a fire. He knows how to set up his shelter. He Let's intentionally get him separated next season. 
<laughs> little rite of passage, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and all this stuff, like, and even like the dirt bikes, like, okay, he knows how to take apart the carburetor on an XR100. How many, how many quote unquote educated kids can do all these things? All this stuff is education. All the fun stuff that, that we think is like fun and exciting, the kids probably think is fun and exciting. Too. And Nathan's what, 13 now? 12. 12. So he went, he well, went bro, and backpack I, hunting with us when he was 11. I, I'll tell you, because I watched it, and I, I talked to you about it afterwards, but I watched him being a participant in Guns and Geese and Rifleman Camp, yeah. running all the drills, and that fucking kid can run an AR. And I don't just mean, I, I'm talking like fire and maneuver, bounding, shooting from behind cover, like IMT, better than fucking... Most adults. Most soldiers. <laughs> Mo- not, not just most adults. Like, yeah. y- you take any non-combat MOS in the military. You take, you just randomly select some guys from, like, a f- the, the, that's MOS as their cooks or their fucking uh, paper pushers. Yeah. They ain't doing that shit, dude. Yeah, you're right. Not even you're close, right. man. Yeah. And so, yeah, life skills is... Uh, I mean, fuck, dude, that we could do a whole episode on that and we should, we should just go right into it because that's something that is, that is lost on our youth is they want to start to push all of these different narratives and all these different agendas and they, under the guise of education while taking away things like fucking breaking down a carburetor. Yeah. You or know? yeah, or learning to measure out two by fours for your cuts or changing <laughs> just, your oil. I just heard, um, actually this morning and I want to say it's like Harvard or Yale or one of the like top academic universities is offering a course on Beyonce. Jesus. Have you, have you heard that bro? No, but I did. Say, I, 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 don't, I, I think I'm Trump gonna, has announced he's dissolving the department of is, education. He yeah, is good riddance. And, uh, if he, like one thing that he said, and I forget, was it, was it Carter that implemented the department of education? No, th- it goes back further. Does it go that. further? However far it goes back. You might be right. When that was implemented, U.S. college students and U.S. Um, high schoolers were ranked number one in the world. Mm. We had the most successful students coming out of high school and coming out of college. Yeah. And now we're number 24. Yeah. So the feds got involved yeah. and manipulated all the funding and made all of these fucking bureaucrats and all these backdoor deals and consistently, and it's data, it's measurable, consistently we've become lower performers. Yeah. And he's like, we're fucking done with this. Yeah, good. We are done. And the other thing that he's going to do, and, and I don't know exactly how this works, maybe you do, but the way in which college gets their federal funding mm-hmm. is through accreditation. Okay. So accreditation means your school has to meet these standards and if you meet these standards, oh yeah, to 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 maintain your federal dollars, yes, yeah. right. Well, Trump, according to one of the videos that he posted, because he's dropping knowledge, he's yes. dropping oh, videos he's every dropping fucking bombs, day, dude. dude. I love it. It's awesome. Uh, one of the videos that he said, he's like, one of the ways they've been able to really manipulate the system, these major woke universities, is they control the accreditation system. Yeah. So it's like, hey, we can kind of mold these accreditors to to meet whatever really we desire. And then we get our federal funding and he goes, I'm firing all the accreditors and we're going to put people in there that are literally here to make education one affordable two, um, like high quality education. When they leave, he goes, I want, I want our kids to be tested so we can have data and show like, Hey, they, they came to school at this level and they left at this level. They should be more intelligent human beings. That's the whole point of this. And then he's like, and then also, we're going to use this system to combat all the fucking radical, like school should not be about push pushing agendas. It should be about, yeah, it needs to be about educating people. Yeah. And dude, so many people are mad about that. Oh, and seriously? it's like, Oh fuck. Yeah, oh, dude. Wow. Like the rat, like all the fucking, I, I'm happy because he said he's going to pull federal funding from any university that participated in the censorship efforts of the last eight yes, years. Yes, dude. And university of Washington is, neck deep with uh CISA and the uh like what uh Michael I don't know, I don't know what CISA is okay CISA got it right here it is the Cybersecurity and infrastructure security agency and so th- there were a couple of I think law or was it laws passed about dis and misinformation that or maybe it was just uh 
regulations that they you know wrote up and implemented themselves but they were just part of like a a university policy yes they were working with the fbi the cia i think british mi6 and it's it's documented that the university of washington and stanford were also assisting in the censorship so this is back during the uh uh, the 20 i guess it would have been the 2019 campaign or no it would have been the 2020 campaign election at the end of the year when the fbi was sending uh uh censorship requests directly to Twitter and Meta and whatnot in direct violation of the First Amendment. So this is good. The University of Washington should f- fucking lose its funding for participating yes. in that. I actually think people should be fucking publicly strung yes, up this, for this. It, this. It's so much deeper. It's the First Amendment for a reason because it's the most important one and the people who have attacked it just full full send, they, they should be dealt with severely. They should not be allowed to just fade away into... Uh, yeah. The hereafter. Oh, I'm going to take an early retirement and uh, like, fuck you. Yeah. No, like, you're going to prison. You should be fucking beaten to death publicly. Yeah. Like, cause dude, and, and even more so, right? Because w- what do people always say? Like, oh, well, you know, the first amendment doesn't apply to private companies. Okay. Technically you're right. That's why if somebody's saying something in this gym that I don't like, I can say, get the fuck out of here. Right. Mm-hmm. Government actors cannot participate yeah. in limiting free speech. The, the Twitter files showed. And that. they that's exactly yeah. what they're doing, dude. And uh bro, I'm so excited. Uh Trump is claiming, I mean, dude, if he does we'll everything, we yeah, yeah, we'll see. see, right? I don't want to get too excited because talk is cheap. Yep. Even though people are now moving into office that I think were the better choice, at the end of the day it's still politics yeah. and there's games that get played because I mean, he said some things on his last uh campaign that he never ended up going through with, yeah, right? Like build the. It'd be nice to have the wall there in its entirety. I'm putting Hillary in jail. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, bro, that's another thing that's proven is like the Clintons fucking manufactured. They are dirty. Yeah, all, she manufactured all of the Russian collusion. Yes. The, like, the Hunter Biden laptop, or the, uh, sorry, the uh, the fifty one intelligence officials who basically is that perjury or what what do you call that when you intentionally sign a false document yes, especially dude. to interfere with a, a national election well it's all kinds of things and they all still have security it should be fucking treason yeah that's what it should be and you yeah. should be fucking killed for it dude like when you are intentionally deceiving the american people to maintain power and get and, and why, why are people doing that so they reap a personal benefit so their party reaps a personal benefit they are willing to lie, cheat, and steal to be able to maintain power. That's fucking treason. Yes. Like, that's the whole the whole government of the people, by the people, for the people is the exact opposite of that. Not There's a few elite people that purposefully and intentionally manipulate the narrative and pay people off and paint other people out to be criminals and then have your, your buddies that are judges fucking bring up false charges and false prosecutions like all this stuff is fucking treason and it's all out there now yeah. and if, if trump does what he says he's gonna do by putting people like uh vivek ramaswamy and elon musk in charge of gutting the government putting rfk in charge of bringing health back to our fucking children and our public schools uh tulsi just, gabbard wow what position did she just get appointed been considered for uh was it department of S- uh, Secretary of State? No, it wasn't Secretary of State. I literally just saw it. I, I'm drawing a blank. But anyways, he's building his cabinet of these people that seems like their fucking brains work pretty well, and it seems like they have I integrity, so. man. Yeah, I, I just hope they actually go offensively after the people who have, like you said, it's treason. It, the, the people that tried intentionally to fuck up this country should be dealt with in the most severe terms. And, like, bro, if they fucking gut the FBI... And the fucking ATF and the Department of Education. Well, think, think about like, 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 let's take the FBI under their watch right now. Child trafficking is at an all time high. And what what are their main investigations? Are they still working yeah, on MAGA? Trump? MAGA is their main investigation. January sixth is probably their biggest budget line item. And, and bro, like, and they they should be dissolved. They should be dissolved. And then the the people that were key players should be publicly executed. Yeah. And that's the fucking truth. Yeah. And we should be able to say that because treason is punishable by fucking death yeah and if you're trying to set up americans yeah you're literally trying to set up yeah. i mean the 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 uh the fbi set up that assassination of uh uh governor whitmer did you yes. hear about that yes they set it up 12 12 of the 14 participants 
in that little whatever were on, were paid informants of the FBI. Bro. So they basically they, they, they had twelve of their guys set up two like backwoods retards to fucking fail. And guess what? Those guys walked. Good. They fucking were acquitted of charges, man. They should be. And it's like now it, now there should be charges for every agent that participated. That's right, that. dude. That's yeah. right. Punishable by fucking death. Every single one and of them. And bro, I saw this first hand as a deputy working with the FBI on a much smaller scale, right? And I've told the story on the podcast before, but they were going after this international arms dealer, right? And so they were in the Philippines trying to bust this international arms dealer, and it was undercover FBI agents doing international deals, and they were supposed to meet this guy and do some type of transaction, and he got spooked and never showed. Okay. He must have caught wind or got his spidey senses or whatever, right? And they're like, well, and this is typical government. I've seen this over and over and over with criminal cases when they're like, well, we couldn't get the big fish we were after, but we've already put all these resources into this arms dealing case. Bro, this was literally their case. Let's uh, let's elicit some help from locals to load a Connex box full of weapons and we'll tell them that we're shipping it to America. Oh, shit. So then they end up getting a bunch of poor people who are like, yeah, fuck it, I'll do A bunch something. of 20-year-old kids, bro, right? And they fucking, hey, we're going to load up this with, with fucking RPGs and machine guns, and then we're going to ship it to America. Like, yeah. those kids don't give a fuck where it's going. No, it's, it's manual labor. To them, it's, it's, it's manual, manual labor, labor dude. Yeah. And, and, bro, it was such a fucking shitty case that they didn't even extradite them. You know what they fucking did to these kids? Uh, and, and, bro, I watched these kids go to jail. I sat through their fucking trial. Jesus. They said, hey, as a way of saying thank you for helping us with get, get all this stuff loaded, we bought you tickets to the L.A. Dodgers game and flights. Holy shit. And when these fucking kids, so they flew them to when LA these so fucking kids them? landed at Holy LAX, shit. they arrested them. That's a true story that I watched with my own fucking eyes. Jesus. And even back then when I was fucking in the thick of being in law enforcement, I was like, man, what, what, what is this, man? So it gets worse because... The public defender, man, I wish I, bro, you know what? I'm going to look into this. I yeah. would love to have that public defender on my podcast and really dive into this story. Yeah. Now that we know the FBI is filled with fraudulent, fake son of a bitches, mm -hmm. right? I'm going to do that. I'm going to find that guy. Yeah. I'll even fly to LA. Um, he's like, hey, I flew to the Philippines and did a bunch of in investigatory work on the agents that were down there. Mm -hmm. You're going to be really surprised to hear what they were doing while they're down yeah. there. Hookers and blow. Hookers and fucking, yeah, partying and fucking hookers. There's some club, and I think it's in Manila, called Air Force One. Hmm. And they were there, fucking hookers, partying all the time. And he brings this all up during the, he's like, does anyone else think that this is something that we should be taking a second look at? And bro, the fucking court system is notorious for being like, um, well, unfortunately, that is not indicative or that is not, those pieces of knowledge are a moot point in regards to the criminal case at trial. I want the jurors to please disregard everything that you just heard. And it's like, no, no, no. If my tax dollars are paying special agents to fly around the world targeting arms dealers, mm -hmm. I should be able to have a reasonable expectation that they're not out there just fucking hookers, right? Yeah. Don't get me wrong. Or using my tax dollars That's exactly to arrest right. low-level laborers in Mexico. That's right, dude. Well, Philippines for this Philippines, one. Philippines, sorry. But still, and it's like, I remember that case. That would have been probably 2012, 2013. And I was a deputy fucking taking these kids to their hearings and to their trials. And I remember just thinking, like, dude, this feels off. What yeah. the fuck is going on? I saw them do the same, another similar case where the this was a fraud case where a guy was uh, soliciting funds for a movie through all these different telemarketers, and I guess that's a that's one way that Hollywood works sure, is that yeah. like you solicit funds. Hey, this is the movie we're gonna make. This is the th this is like the script. This is the production cost, and if you invest in it, if the movie does well, you get an investment on your or you get a return on your investment. The guy was soliciting all these funds and then he was just fucking funneling the money back to himself he yeah. wasn't actually making these movies right? right well when the fbi brought up a criminal case against him literally as they're serving the warrant he locks his office door and blows his brains out case closed right 
Nope. Oh, no. They went after all the telemarketers. And, bro, that's who I was sitting in uh, trial with, these Jesus telemarketers. Christ. And they're like, well, you technically were the ones soliciting illegal funds. And I remember this guy. His name was Daryl Van Snowden. He goes, I was making minimum wage to call people. Like, you think I, you think I would fucking be part of a grand scheme? Yeah. And, and he looked, he was a fucking small black dude with dreads. He looked exactly like the comedian Cat Williams. Yeah. And, bro, here's the cool part about the story. Because he's a telemarketer, one thing he was good at, charisma and talking to people Mm -hmm. and he represented himself oh nice did he get he got acquitted bro in federal court against the fbi and that doesn't federal court i believe it's a 96 percent conviction right you don't win it's because you're not supposed to yeah just like we're talking about how backwards the fbi is the court's purpose is to put people into the jail cells so that the jail cells stay maxed out so that the owners of the prison it's get their fucking full dark, federal man. Funding. It's yes. dark. It's all dark. And this fucking dude, and bro, he had all of his eyes dotted and his T's crossed. He was a smart fucking dude. Good. And uh, he says, they're like, well, you're, you're, you're sitting here telling the jury you make minimum wage. Please explain to the jury how someone just making minimum wage and struggling to get by drove a BMW. And he goes, I love that you brought that up. He goes, I knew you motherfuckers were going to bring up my BMW. I knew it. And like the judge would be like, order, there's no cursing in my courtroom, right? And he goes, no, judge, this is a this is a conspiracy to string this nigger up. That's what you're doing right now. And he's like, if you say one more statement like that, I will declare a mistrial and we will be starting over. Yeah. And uh I remember telling him, I was like, let's take a bathroom break. I said, bro, yeah, straight up, dude. Yeah. The jury, every time you bust their balls, they're smiling and laughing. Yeah. That tells me they're on your side. If you fucking push it too far and get a mistrial, that means you get a whole new jury. Yeah. I said, and then you don't know what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. I think it's going to work out well for you, dude. <laughs> and so he's like, okay, okay, I'll calm down. So we go back in. And he goes, I knew that the prosecution was going to bring up the fact that I, that I drive a Beamer. So guess what I brought today? A picture of my Beamer. (laughs) That's amazing. It was literally like a fucking 1970s fucking rusted out hoopty piece of shit. that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, there's my Beamer. I must, oh, I'm fucking some rich high roller, aren't I? Look at that fucking thing. And and they're all laughing, right? It was at that case that I realized the judicial system doesn't determine guilty versus innocent in trial. They determine if you are a likable person. If the jury thinks you're a likable person, they're like, "Ah, I don't think that guy did that. I think even if he did, yeah, yeah. We really if he's a likable person, we don't need to put that guy behind bars. And uh, I've always said, if I ever find myself in that setting, I think I'd go pro se, which means you represent yourself. Okay, and you you waive right to counsel, or and you also waive hiring counsel. Okay, and you just fucking you represent yourself as your own lawyer. Yeah. Because, bro, you don't need a law degree to fucking sift to through truth and then communicate with people. In fact, half of the fucking lawyers there, I don't know if they're on the spectrum or something, but it's like they're fucking retarded, man. Well, you got to, Jesus, man, by the time you get through law school, you've done so much just rote memorization, right? Because K through 12 is just memorizing and regurgitating onto a bubble sheet test and then go through a, a bachelor's degree and then law school is just reading and memorizing laws that have already been written yeah so it's yeah it, it probably does require a certain type of brain <laughs> but bro i mean to circle back to what we were talking about it's already known i would say i don't think this is this is not tinfoil hat anymore the fbi has played active roles i mean the governor whitmer thing is a perfect example of that people were acquitted because it was fucking entrapment right yeah. there is people that were purposefully and intentionally stoking the flame during January 6th. Yes. What is one of the things that is not protected under free speech is the incitement of violence. You can't yell fire at a theater right. and be protected under free speech, right? There were people who were like, let's raid the Capitol. Let's yeah. go. Let's yeah. go. And Ray Epps was yeah. one of their names, yeah. right? And you start uh-huh. to dive into this stuff and you're like, oh man, you guys would literally, literally turn on your own people and put innocent people in prison yeah. because a political narrative is being pushed down from the administration. Yeah. And instead of, bro, I stood up over a fucking COVID vaccine, or not a COVID vaccine, a, a, a COVID narrative, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Like, to me, it it wasn't like, 
the cops were doing. I mean, don't get me wrong. I believe they were doing egregious shit, shutting businesses down, limiting people's free speech, limiting people's ability to go to church, all that stuff. It was important, but it wasn't like straight up like, hey, this is a fabricated story that we are going to fucking promote and enforce to put innocent people in jail. Mm-hmm. Like if that narrative came down from any fucking agency, I would hope everybody from the newest fucking deputy or in the case of the FBI, every special agent to literally the director would be like, fuck you. But they won't say that to right. the administration yeah. because all of this stuff is controlled politically, mm-hmm. which means these people are all fucking cowards. Even, even like I've been kind of disappointed in the law enforcement profession over the last oh, four or five have. years. Because, yeah, we've talked a lot about this. Yeah, even even at the you know I expect that at the higher echelons of of rank and file that you get the people who are willing to play ball with the system and that it's more important to them to maintain their their position than it is to protect citizens' rights. But at the at the street level officer level, the the willingness to go along. As with with what they know violates their own personal morals, and they know violates uh, our own civil rights. Yeah, that's been really disappointing. Well, I've seen men who are some of the most courageous men I know, and this was from this was in Ramadi, mm-hmm. right? Where when we were contracting in the early days of Ramadi, we were making what thirty k a month or something. Mm-hmm. That's big fucking money yeah. for fucking rangers, old. seals, and force recon marines, yeah. right? No issues running the streets, knowing we're going to get ambushed on a daily basis, mm-hmm. and fucking crawling up on the rooftop and looking for fucking dudes that are trying to assault the buildings and like doing the job that is inherently dangerous. No yes. problems with that. As soon as a contract dispute comes down, and Tony Nicholson, the, the head of Triple Canopy, said, you know what, guys, you better fucking blow. And it's like, as soon as money is on the line, I watched men that seemed very courageous kind of tuck their fucking tails. Hmm. And I was like, dude, wh- what, what is happening right now? You're, you're afraid of Tony Nicholson because he has the potential to take your job where you're making 30K a month, even though what he's saying is morally and ethically there's, there's something false. there about the social programming of authority yes and, and dude. believing that you if someone else grants you the authority to violate somebody's civil rights and you go hey man i'm just doing my job just doing my job or, yeah you if, know what i think I've that's been, a that's a very interesting ordered, point yeah, if i've been ordered to charge that machine gun bunker well you know what i've been given this authority and i'm just doing my job and i'll go to my death instead of saying like why am i charging that machine gun bunker yeah, <laughs> right yeah, yeah. i mean if it's bullshit right yeah or doing saying why am uh why are you telling me to do this yeah i i part of me wants to get pulled over by a state patroller out on the freeway just so i can ask them like what what do you see yourself as doing during the day and like well we're here to protect the community how yeah you, well, you especially pulled, you pulled me over to give me a fine not to protect me and here's the thing bro we're reasonable men right I've got my Mustang up to 140 miles an hour before, yeah. right? I have yeah. okay, fucking. If I pass, if I go by a state patrol guy running radar and I'm going 140 and he fucking pulls me over, I'd be like, bro, I was, I'm, I'm just being complete. I'm being a stupid wild animal. Yep. Seeing, I seeing how hard I could push this I, car. I know the game and you yeah. got me. Yeah, exactly. And at that speed, I might be leaving in handcuffs. Yeah. And if that's what you do, bro, we're straight, man. Yeah. You're protecting your community. Yeah. We don't need cars on the road going 140 miles an hour, but uh-huh. I wanted to see what that thing could do, and I did. <laughs> That's what they're there for, though. Yes. Right? Like Lappin says, I think the only time you should be able to pull people over in a vehicle is for reckless endangerment. Yeah. I and agree. reckless endangerment doesn't mean a certain speed. Mm-hmm. It means a certain speed based on the conditions in which that vehicle is operating. Mm-hmm. If you're fucking going 65 miles an hour in a straight line in a, in a, what in a, in a school zone where there's crosswalks and oh, it's 3 yeah. PM and there's flaggers out there. And it's like, Hey, w- we told you this zone is 25 miles an hour because our fucking babies are walking across the road right now. Okay. Now I'm going to fuck it. Now I understand a cop should go after you and fucking give you a fine and some type of corrective action. That's the whole point of why we have police officers enforcing any type of traffic violation. And it's morphed so fucking far the other way that it's like your taillight burned out yesterday. It's $136 going to the state. Yep. And it's like, bitch, when's the last time you checked your taillight? Right? Yeah. yeah. 
And like, dude, I've pulled people over for taillights before. They're even like, and I, and I literally tell them that I'm like, Hey, you know what? The last taillight I found that was burned out was in my wife's forerunner when I was following her to uh, my daughter's fucking game last, last week. Yeah. So I'm not here to bust your balls or get you in trouble. I'm literally here to let you know you got to burn out taillight. That's it, man. Yep. Have a nice day. Bye. And it's that fucking easy because why in the fuck, why would an individual start to get off on finding people for going 72 yeah. in a fucking 70? Well, remember police cars used to say to serve and protect on the side. I don't think they do anymore. I don't know what they say. I'm sure. I mean, every I've, I've looked because really? that's the other thing is I want to ask who. Who do you serve and protect? Who yeah. do you serve and protect? Well, and the thing is, like, I mean, I still got lots of cops that are, or lots of buddies that are cops. A lot of our teammates are cops. Yeah. Every time we bring up cops, I tell people, like, I know a lot of good cops, mm-hmm. but you all, know, the, all well intentioned. But do you know the cops that we know though? But how many are would, the guys that are training that are fit? That's true. That are motivated. Yeah. If or, I mean, you can't, you can't bully them physically. You're not going to bully them. Well, well, you never know. You never know. You never know. They're, they're, the, the spectrum includes fucking all types. Yeah. But no, you're right, man. And it should be known, and that's why I hope they make an example of these motherfuckers, man. If, if you intentionally, not just neglect or fucking like it being ignorant, but if you intentionally participated in something to fuck over Americans mm-hmm. for expressing their appreciation for a political candidate. Yeah. If you that's, heard, if that's you, what they did. Yeah. And, and these fucking people, and the, the craziest thing about this is it's like this, this to me is not right versus left. Obviously I lean conservative, but if I found out that like there was a misinformation campaign about Joe Biden, where Donald Trump funded a bunch of lies and then the FBI supported it and then, like, man, people ended up in jail over it. I'd be like, lock those motherfuckers up. Yeah. It's not about my political ideology. It's about you guys fucking violating Americans' rights. Yeah, I don't understand why the, the left can't see that. But I think it's because they literally, they literally think that was an insurrection. Uh, you know what I mean? <laughs> It would, it would be interesting to talk to someone who would try to defend that. But when you see the videos of people like walking between velvet ropes through the Capitol and, it, and, and I know and, there's and people there was, out there that hey, say this was an insurrection and there was no violence. The explanation. That's yeah. let's, and there was no weapons. Like, come on, what yeah. are we talking about? One person was shot and it was yeah. a young woman. Yeah. You shot a woman in the face. Yeah. Like, fuck you, dude. Yeah. Right. And, and just to be clear for anyone who doesn't know, it was the Capitol Police who shot, not not one of the, the protesters. Oh, yeah, 100%, man. For clarity. And then do you remember the next, like, in the, the days and weeks following, they're like, four of our Capitol Police were killed. Oh, that's and, right. And it's like, a one guy had a heart attack the next day or some shit like that, and they were able to fucking manipulate that. And it's like, dude, and, and here's the thing, dude. Don't get me wrong. I have fucking arrested lots of people for trespass. I have. It's a misdemeanor, mm-hmm. and you literally don't even book them. Yeah. You you their their arrest is literally a citation. Yep. So if you can if you want to say there was laws that were violated, like guys going into Nancy Pelosi's office, I'm not saying that there wasn't sure. laws yeah. that are violated. Write them a citation, right? Um, but some of them are still in prison, and this gets back without to, due process. I hope Trump does. What needs to be done because one of the very first things that should be done is those people need to be pardoned. I think, let's make predictions. I think that happens on January 20th. I hope so. I think that happens on January fucking 20th. But the sad part is, is, uh, do you know that there's four of those people that have been going through this process that have committed suicide? I'm sure. And even, even after they're pardoned, they've already been financially ruined. And emotionally ruined, man. You want to talk about PTS? Yeah. Like... Hey, I wasn't put in a fucking box for fucking four years. Some of these people, like, literally the Fifth Amendment is the right to due process. A, a public, a, a speedy public trial. Hey, I get to be put before a jury of my peers, which that's a whole other podcast, that your peers. Jury selection is one of the most convoluted fucking processes. Oh, yeah. That's, that's you've where the ever, trial is made. You've ever fucking seen in your life. Yeah. I literally remember sitting in trials and they're like, today's... And the, the fucking prosecutor gets up there and then the defense gets up there and like, today's trial is about selling marijuana illegally. Oh, no. By a show of hands, who supports the use of marijuana in this room? And like four people will raise their hand 
and they they get like it's like a fucking college draft where they have all these little rules and and I get this many people and then yeah. you get th- that many yep. people and they're like okay I want to thank and excuse juror number thirty two he he supports marijuana we can't have him on the jury and it's like dude yeah. you should literally line up twelve people yeah you twelve and you're the jury yeah like or maybe maybe some like initial questionnaire just to determine competence mm-hmm. like well, if this guy's determining someone's faith faith yeah, that's true. True. Maybe we see if his brain works, but we don't get to dive into his fucking background, his political theory, like all that shit, but yeah. they do. No, it, it, the whole thing is weird. Um, Bro, we're going to, I, I'm really excited to see what happens on January, January 20th. 20th. And all the stars seem to be aligning and it looks like common sense is going to come back to America. He's appointed people to remove all the, the woke bullshit out of the military, you, all the transgender fucking surgeries. Like, yeah. but, but again, do you think it's concerning that the Republican party will control the house, the Senate and the executive well, as it, well as all the, ca- it, and they basically control the judiciary. Well, here's the thing on that. Cause even though it's right now, it's our team. There's something to be said for checks and balances. For sure, man. And for sure. I, I think that um, this is a result of you kind of reap what you sow, right? Yeah. And it's like... The pendulum went way too it far went one way direction. way too far. And it had to come back hard the other Where direction. you're saying like... Uh, I mean, dude, gays against groomers. You ever watch any of their shit? I'm aware of them. I don't really So care. I watched a video this morning where it's like two fat lesbians walking on a beach, holding each other's hands, and they're like... You know why, like, sounding all fucking butch, all fat and disgusting. You know why we're in Costa Rica? Because we can hold hands on the beach and not be in fear of our safety and in fear of our life. And then the, it, it transitions over to this gay man. And he's like, I've been married to a man for 15 years in America. And we hold hands every day. And not one time in the last 15 years has someone expressed being disgusted by us or wanting to. And he's like, it's all fear-mongering bullshit yeah bro a lot of gay people's brains function perfectly fine yeah they just want they don't like pussy yeah like that's about the extent of the difference right so dude the gay people are a lot of them are mad that they got pulled into Into this queer stuff we need to cut babies dicks off like what Mm -hmm. that has nothing to do with sexual orientation Mm -hmm. Or like we need to read to kindergartners yeah, about they actually butt reverted, fucking. Yeah, gay gay rights was has been it's gone backwards. It's gone it's, backwards. It's regressed. And bro, like if you wanted to sit Logan down and read her a book about fucking pussy, well, we got a problem. Yeah, like it's not about what you're fucking. It's about bringing all this bullshit front and yeah. center, fixating on it, mm. and bringing it into the youth. And now, like, morphing it into all of these fucking surgical procedures, hormone replacement and shit. And it's like, that is why the pendulum, that's one of the reasons the pendulum swung so far. I saw a meme the other day that's like, you want to know why, you want to know why the pendulum swung red? And it's a picture. Remember the suitcase thief? Oh, God. Right? That redheaded A bald kid, or a bald dude that wears dresses, lipstick, and is a prolific klepto. Yeah. And he like, was like, he was a member of the, of the cabinet. cabinet. Yeah. And it's like, and then you got fucking that big fat dude that thinks he's a bitch. The secretary. Yeah. Of defense. <laughs> <laughs> and bro, like, here's the thing, man. Uh, that's not me being insensitive. That's the so, truth. Like, that, that is what that is. That is what you are. You're a big fat fucking man. dude that thinks you're a woman, which yeah. tells me two things. You are physically and mentally ill. Yeah. Now, if not you want to be running, if you want to be military. physically and mentally ill, I don't care either. Yeah. If that dude wants to fucking pretend to be a woman and then fuck some woman that pretends to be a dude and like you go like, like whatever. Lincoln Osiris. Yeah. Yeah. Go Sound like a man who pretended to be a man who <laughs> pretended to be another dude. <laughs> <laughs> but to have that thing being someone in a leadership position that is supposed to be like directing our nation towards, uh-huh. towards health. Bro, you're the you're the opposite yeah. of health, and so it's all the little things. And not that only enough, that, but enough, on the world stage, your persona matters. Like uh, the projection think? of no, but the thing is, people here in this country don't understand that because no, they we, don't because society weak. has become so good and so soft. Well, it, that when you go to some of these countries, 
they they respect strength. They respect a leader who can fuck. You know what I mean? There's a reason Vladimir Putin had all those videos of him doing judo. Yeah, is because when you show up riding in North his, Korea, riding his horse with fucking his fucking shirt, shirt off. off like the Marlboro Man yeah. or some shit. Yeah. No, bro. There's a reason why, and I guarantee you that you also experience this. You know how many times I got berated in the grocery store for walking down the soup aisle backwards? Fucking zero. Yeah, exactly. Exactly zero. Yes. Because I'm a 200-pound athlete that'll fucking murder you. Yeah. People know that. And when people know that... That's the micro level. There's a macro level when you're dealing with around. It's the exact same mindset. You you articulate it perfectly. That's the macro level. Bro, when I look at you, do I want to fight you or do I not want to fight you? That is every single man that I make eye contact with, we have that discussion with each other. Yeah. And you want to know yeah. what's cool about that discussion? Is when you re- when you meet another motherfucker, you go, you're going down the aisle of the grocery store, and I'm walking up in a dude, and he's fucking all yoked, and maybe he has fucking cauliflower or whatever, right? As soon as you see another motherfucker, you usually give a little head nod. Yeah. What's up, man? Yeah. You know what I mean? Because... Dude, we're not. It's an acknowledgement. We're not that this enemies. Hurt. We're yeah. not enemies, dude. Yeah, it's, it's exactly this is what it is. would be way better if we slap, <laughs> if we yeah, bump fists and smile. And uh, people that project weakness don't understand that you are always assessing and being assessed. Yeah. The first, the, like the first impression of a man is your physical body, and not just like your fat ratio or your muscle ratio, but your posture. And the way in which you carry yourself, yeah, yeah. the way in which you look at well, people. It's making me laugh because I'm thinking about the same people who are pro-war in Ukraine are also pro-Kamala Harris as the commander-in-chief. And I'm trying to figure out like, if you're, if you're saying, yes, let's go get in a fist fight. Give me the give me the retarded girl over there. Yeah. <laughs> She's on yeah. my team. Well, this, bro, bro, did you see what Vladimir Putin said last week? Uh-uh. He said... Um, Something along the lines, and I'm, I'm fucking, uh, this is not verbatim, but this is the, the overarching theme. He goes, you know, with Trump coming back in office, I want to congratulate him. I watched him be shot and stand up with courage. Yeah. Now yeah. I know President Trump is a man of courage because he proved it. Right. And I'm open to discussions about the relationships between our country yes. moving forward. And you know what his last statement was? He goes, and it's not beneath me to be the one that picks up the phone and dials his number. Good. And bro, why, and like, why how can sh- anyone yes. be mad about that? Right. And people be like, Russia is our enemy. Like, why would why do we want them to be our enemy? Why are we so fixated on having an enemy in Russia? Why well, would we not want them to be trade and, partners? And it's exactly what you just said. It's a perfect correlation on a micro level. If you and I fucking walk and and size each other up, and we come to the conclusion, we're probably better off not fighting each other. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean you're the greatest person in the world or I'm a piece of shit or any of that. It yeah. just means if we can each just go our own way and do our thing, everybody's better off for yeah. it. Or better yet, maybe we can even make a little business deal that works for That's both right. of us. Yeah. So why? And, and remember when when uh, Trump went to North Korea and he met with Kim Jong Un, mm-hmm. and they came to some type of agreement, right? And people were like, "That's treason." If Barack Obama had done the same thing, he would have got the Nobel He's Peace Prize. He would have got the Nobel Peace Prize. Yeah. It doesn't matter if the world, like, if these world dictators are the evilest people in the world and what they do to their own country is fucking egregious, right? Like, that's not our job to be the fucking world police. Every exactly. time we try and do it. It's our job to not fight a war with them. It cost us billions yeah. of dollars yeah. and thousands of and that's, lives. That is the, the president's job is not to go over there and be their friend or to necessarily be their best or their their worst enemy. It's his job to not get us into a fight with them and try to figure out if we can actually improve our situation through some sort of relationship with them. Yeah. That's and, it. And it's he, that simple. And, bro, like, Trump even said, and a lot of people hated him on Rogan because, like, he can be long-winded. He can go off on fucking tangents and shit. But at the end of the day, what is the substance of what he's saying? And he's like, dude, me and Vladimir Putin, me and Xi Jinping, like, dude, we have an understanding of with each other. Yeah. And he's like, and that's that. And I like, cause Rogan tried to dig in a little deeper. I don't remember if it was with Putin or uh, Xi Jinping, but he said, no, 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 I'm not going to go into the details. Cause our relationship is between us. Mm. He's like, but I can make a phone call and we can work out a lot of things. Yeah. Isn't that who you fucking want? Yes. That's why you vote for <laughs> like, that person. <laughs> like Kamala Harris couldn't even sit at this table with us right now. No. She couldn't oh. sit at this table with two random fucking dudes, an electrician and a small business owner, mm-hmm. 
and just talk to us about the things we've been talking about. Nope. And like, you, you fucking think you can sit at across the table from Vladimir fucking Putin? Yeah, no. Well, and you know what else is amazing about this election this time around is the precedent is now set that, that sound bites on the media aren't going to work anymore. If you can't sit through three hours of, of an authentic conversation, you're not, you will not be elected. Well, and bro, fucking, uh, that was a pro move for both J.D. Vance and Trump to do a handful of yeah. long format discussions because, dude. Because it's impossible for their competition to do it. And, and dude, the cool thing about it is they went off on some tangents. Let's talk yeah. about the UFC. Yeah. Let's talk about, fuck, yeah. like, whatever. You get a sense of who they are, Let's, not just, you, you learn a lot about their policies, but you also get a sense of who they are as a person. And so I think a lot of people who are independents who may not have leaned torn, leaned toward Trump originally they actually got to see that he's not what uh you know MSNBC makes him out to be there yeah. is he is a little bit more personable than than what you would believe if you were only watching left-leaning media and, and here's the thing like Trump rubs a lot of people the wrong way because he calls people like Rosie O'Donnell a fat pig right and it's like <laughs> women have a he a fat pig right and it's like dude yeah. take your feelings out of it yeah. right and just like just because he called some dumb bitch a fat pig. Don't it, they also call him names? That's, of course so they do. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's like, well, he needs to be presidential. That's not presidential. Okay, take your feelings out of it. And, like, just because you call someone a fat pig doesn't mean, like, bro, the, the, there's people that literally believe he's going to put gays in concentration camps. I know. Uh, women's rights are now going to be stripped like one of the fucking, I saw this thing, I forget who it was. It might have been Kamala Harris, but I don't want to say it for sure because I don't remember who said it. But it was some political woman that said, women in America are going back to being the most oppressed women on planet Earth. Jesus Bro, Christ. go to Iran. I know. Yeah. Like, are you Afghanistan? At, yeah, go to they, Afghanistan. They literally ran in fear when we came driving around the corner because if a man were to lay eyes on them, they, they get beaten. Be, yeah. Yeah. When we would go to Paideen's house, mm -hmm. a guy that was pro-America, a guy that supported our mission, a guy that helped us out. As guests. A guy that walked us out of a fucking minefield, right? Yeah. The women couldn't come meet us. They had to stay in the back room. Yeah. And they prepared the food. And him, his sons, and his young daughters that haven't been through puberty yet got to bring that out with us and have a feast. Like... And, and, and you got people saying that Amer women in America are going to be oppressed. Yeah. The most oppressed in the world. Fuck, dude. It's, and this is the reality. That, that, that in these people's minds, that's the truth. Yeah. There's oh, people crying, thinking like all the rights are going to be stripped. And it's like, dude, Trump has never said anything even remotely close to that. Yeah. Or like the abortion thing was one of the biggest sticking points for people. Yep. There's like 12 year old girls crying on TikTok saying, I think if I get said, raped, I have to have yeah. the baby now. All he said is he's sending it. He thinks it's good that it's back in the state's hands. Yeah. Which guys, that's how this is supposed to work. Each state is, that's the point of 50 different states. Otherwise it would be one homogenous. And, and guess what? State. Guess what, dummy? If you want to use abortion as a right, as a method of birth control, I personally think that's pretty gross, right? Yeah. If me me and Jenny in our forties now, if we find out she's pregnant, guess what we're gonna do? We're yeah. gonna have a baby. Your 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 perception of all that changes after you've held your own babies. That's right, dude. But here's the thing. If you don't agree with me on that, there's a lot of states you can take a flight to. If you're in Texas and you want an abortion, you can get on a flight to California and have your fucking abortion. That's never gonna change. Yeah. California is never gonna fucking change because they're radicalized fucking blue. And, yeah. and all their policies are going to reflect that. Like, when I needed my hernia surgery, guess what I did? I Texas, found a doctor yeah, that was South in South Carolina, Carolina yeah. who was the most proficient hernia surgeon, and I flew and had a that's, surgery. That's a solid point. When so, you, like, you, go, you do yeah. go to the expert when you need a surgery. So, dude, so, go so the shut experts. the fuck up. And, oh, I'm sorry that if if it's it's so out of your way that you have to fucking take a fucking red eye and fly to California for the weekend to kill your baby. I'm sorry that's a big inconvenience for you, but in America, that's always going to be an option for you. So why are you fucking crying about it? No. It's nuts, man. I, yeah. Abortion is definitely, like for me, it's the most difficult issue. I definitely lean more and more pro-life, like the older I get, and especially post-children. Like in my 20s, I was 
that was part of that. I don't give a fuck. Like you do whatever you want. I don't really care. I'm going to go to Iraq and try to make some abortions myself. Yeah. Fucking. Um, but I'll say this, dude, and this is a very, very, very unpopular thing to say in the conservative world. But like, bro, when we found out our women were pregnant, fucking it's a celebration, right? Yeah. It, yeah. And don't get me wrong. There's some nerves around it. And it's like, oh, fuck, what are we going to do? Right. But never once did my brain say, oh, I fucking kill that baby. Like my, yeah. like, I, I think yeah. if your brain, like, dude, every single, literally down to fucking single cell organisms celebrate procreation. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, or maybe celebrates the wrong word, they, but they, they inherently fucking, they, they get an endorphin dump. They, they chase yeah. reproduction. And it's supposed to be something that every single life form on planet Earth chases mm -hmm. and, and f not only chases, but fucking fights for. Mm -hmm. So if, if you're a person that has, you find out, oh, I'm pregnant and your brain says, yep, time to kill this thing. Uh, maybe we do need to end your fucking family tree. Yeah. Maybe those, may, I think your genetics are fucking broken. What if about, you want to, uh, what about rape and incest? I think rape and incest, um, Yes, I think if I think if you get fucking raped by some fucking psychopath, mm -hmm. like, and, and this isn't fucking like my boyfriend is two years older than me, and I'm I'm seventeen and a half, and he's nineteen and a half. Like, no, 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 fucking shut up. Literally, you're jogging down the Centennial Trail, and some and, psychopath yeah. fucking grabs you and holds you on the ground and impregnates you. I don't think we should tell a woman she has to have that person's baby. Okay. I don't. It, but at the same time, I'm also not going to sit here and say my way is the only way or yeah. my way is right yeah, 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 and yeah. your way is wrong. The reality of what we see in politics is people will find the most abstract idea. Yes. Which, bro, abortion is not being, is not occurring because our women are getting snatched up while they're jogging and being impregnated. That's literally a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a percent. And then that's the talking point that everybody sticks to, right? The overwhelming majority of abortions is people using as birth control. Yeah. And you're being fucking, you're being irresponsible. I was just going to say, I wonder what the statistic, statistics are on the number of abortions that result from rape and incest versus just because, oh shit, I've been getting fucked without a condom <sighs> and suddenly things got real and I don't want to do this. Yeah. Bro, I mean, fuck, dude. I remember fucking, like, as a kid, this girl I dated is like, I like the feeling of, of having you come inside of me, right? Oh, shit. And it's like, yeah. we're, we're fucking kids. I'm not doing that. Uh -uh. You don't have to wear a condom. I love the feeling of being cummed inside of. And it's like, even fucking young, dumb hey, brain. She's a crazy bitch. Yeah, even, Run, motherfucker. <laughs> even young, dumb brain is like, that is a problem, uh -huh. right? There will be condoms being mm -hmm. used. Because, uh, duh, what do you fucking think is going to happen? You know, like... All three of my kids, all three of them were one shot wonders. Oh, like, yeah. Me and Jenny yeah. are the opposite of people that struggle to have babies. Yeah. And it was literally like, hey, fly home. This Because I've always been fucking either like on the other side of the country. I was in a police academy in Georgia, whatever, right? And she's like, fly home on November 12th because that's my like the top of my ovulation calendar. Oh, shit. Yeah. Fly home for a day. Go back. Pregnant. Like, if you're a fucking a healthy person and a good athlete and, like, you take care of your body, eat healthy foods, I don't... Getting pregnant, it's going to happen yes. if you don't fuck... Obviously, there's people listening, like, oh, I've done everything. It's like, listen, there's outliers, right? Yeah. But for you young fucking dudes listening, because people at my daughter's school listen to the show as I'm talking <laughs> about a high school girlfriend saying she wants me to come inside her. <laughs> oh, my God. Bro, it is what it is. Oh, no. It's out there. Uh, for you young guys, oh, but it feels better. Yeah, I get it, dude. Yeah, yeah. You will have a fucking baby. Like, you can count on that. Like, that's just the reality of planet Earth. It's not some fucking abstract concept that's hard to understand. Yeah. We all know how this works. Yep. If you do that, you're going to have a baby. Yeah. Okay? So if you disregard common sense, and now you have a baby, and now you want to kill that baby... Yeah. It's like, no, okay, I'm, I'm with you, bro. You're, you're kind of, you're a fucked up person. Yep. Like you made a bunch of bad choices and now you want to kill a baby. That seems bizarre to me. Yeah. That people is. land on that.
well, being a mom at 19 is hard because I, I had uh, aspirations of becoming this career woman. Yeah, I get it. And you made bad choices. Yeah, I, I had aspirations of partying for four years at WSU is what it is. <laughs> yeah. And you know it. But regardless of all of that, dude, um, I think, I honestly think we're going to see the the red wave, as they call it, and the pendulum swinging back. I think it's going to be very beneficial for our country. I hope so. Um, I, I have some, some reservations, reservations yeah. for sure. Well, again, talk is cheap, right? Yeah. And then, and then my conspiratorial brain also starts to be like, dude, is this all like a big dog and pony show? I think so. And Trump is literally controlled opposition. And every, every four to eight years, we let our, our conservative minded people feel like they're winning. And then right. we pull back and let our liberal minded people think they're winning. And meanwhile, they're all fighting amongst themselves. We take all their money and we live at the top of the food chain. I hope that's not what's going on. I think that was what was going on with Bush, Clinton, Bush, Clinton, Obama, Bush, Clinton for yeah. fucking 30 years. Yeah. I think Trump is different. If I had to bet on it, I think Trump is different. But if it if it were to prove, if I were to be proved wrong on that, there's a part of me that'd be like, fuck. I, I, was, I am cautiously optimistic about this administration. I, I, with with having everything controlled by one side, it, it makes me worry. Yeah, that things can go too far. Well, and and that's probably, that's probably exactly what will happen. And then the pendulum will swing so far yeah. that conservatives and and right wing minded people will people will just start to be fucking disgusted by them. You you know where conservatives do it wrong and and. A lot of guys are going to fucking cuss at your fucking radio when you hear this. But forcing your religion into government. Oh, yeah. That's a problem. Yes. Right? Like, yep. there's a reason. And, and, bro, because we're a Christian nation. We're founded on Christian values. Okay, true. Most of my friends are Christian. I hold a lot of Christian beliefs. I'm not saying that that's not truth. But there's a reason why we're supposed to have a separation of church and state. Yeah. There's a reason for that. And you start implementing your religious beliefs and wanting them to be intertwined in government, that actually makes uh, more of a validity for the other side to push back and be like, get these fucking people out of here. Yeah. You know, yeah. like there needs to be prayer in school again. Well, does there Yeah. like, maybe you should no. teach spirituality at your house. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's for mom and dad to teach. And part of that is, and I is, pray dude, I'm a, I, I support and believe in prayer. Mm -hmm. Is that the government's job? Probably not. No. And why do you want the government in charge of your religion? <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. you don't. So fucking keep them out of yeah, it. Yeah, fuck, man. Um, see, it's turned into a fun episode, bro. <laughs> when, yeah. I so started, I, I have my biggest concern with the Trump administration is that one of his campaign promises and one of the things he has really rallied people up about is all of the illegal immigrants that have come into the country over the last four years and that he is going to deport them all. So now... I could see a situation where under the guise of deporting illegal immigrants, what do we need? We need electronic ID. We need uh, passport, you know, electronic oh, yeah, passports. Yeah. You need to restrict travel. So very, very similar to the Patriot Act. Like yes. we're going to have to listen, guys, we're going to have to restrict some of your rights, but it's, it's for under the guise of good. It's, it's so that we can interrogate terrorists. And now you have January six citizens locked up without due process because of the Patriot Act. Did you see that little snippet of the guy that was just appointed um, as the border czar? He oh, was doing yes. a 60 minute yes. interview and the lady goes, estimations say it's going to cost $88 million or maybe billion. I don't remember to deport all the illegal immigrants. He goes, I don't know if that number's true or not. I was like, I don't fucking know. <laughs> <laughs> and she goes, well, do you think that taxpayers dollars should be funding this? He goes, what's your security worth? Like, yeah. that dude clearly doesn't give then a fuck. And maybe you dude. should not have let them in. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, bro, I mean, that's also, like, they were doing that intentionally. Not only, like, people think it was just to get voters, but it was also to manipulate electorates. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Because they do census and they understand, like, as population densities changes, it change how elections work. Oh yeah, they they know where every single electoral vote comes from, mm -hmm. like down to the street address. And so, for for a person to come to the conclusion that we're going to allow people into our country that are not vetted, that haven't went through any type of security background check, uh, didn't go through any normal immigration process, just to keep our our political 
powers in control, it's another off with your head scenario. Yeah. Like that, that is treason and you should be fucking murdered for it. Yeah. And it's an interesting point too, that we know that, you know, mixed in with however many people have come in are known terrorists and Al Qaeda operatives and nothing has come of that yet. Yeah. Which makes me worry that they're saving it for shortly after the inauguration to make it more difficult for the new administration. Well, and if they do that, start looking at deep state shit again. Yeah. I mean, dude, they supposedly all of these fucking documents are going to be released on UFOs, on JFK. Like, if it is determined, which everybody already knows it, that our CIA had a role in the assassination of a sitting president. 100%. Like, but once that's like, hey, this is no longer a conspiracy. Yeah. Now what? Dissolve it. It, is there another option? It has to yeah. be that. All, all of the, this entire intelligence apparatus that includes parts of the Department of Justice needs to be dissolved and just sort of rethought, restructured, restarted. That's really going to fucking... With completely new personnel. Dude, that's really going to tell the American people who the government is, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, uh, yeah, I wonder I wonder what the documents necessarily entail, if, they're, if it's going to talk about motive and whatnot, you know? Fuck. All right. Well, we went for two hours. Oh, um, shit. I, I have a very important podcast to go do, the Enlighten Neanderthals. Yeah, there you go. I love so. the Enlighten Neanderthals, <laughs> dude. Um, you got anything else before you wrap it up? Uh, no. You can find me at uh, my little training company that we run out at our range in Granite Falls, Washington, uh, trainingnorthwestllc.com. Your latest courses are um, we're, we're, r- shooting we're, rifle for hunters, right? Yep. To get, uh, I took Nathan to his hunter safety class last year, and I realized that a lot of people in that class were there because they thought that was going to be their introduction to firearm safety, which the the name kind of implies, but they really don't. Um, yeah, there's so no hands-on stuff in that course, right? Barely. Okay. It's, it's a it's a three hours of really poorly taught hands on uh, <laughs> like Nathan's sitting there like pointing at the guy. Cause he keeps like sweeping himself with the gun he's demonstrating with. And God, I, was, I was like, don't say a word. Don't say a fucking <laughs> word. Just be quiet. We're going to get the fuck out of here. Um, but anyway, this, this is for people who are interested in hunting or even just brand new to shooting. They don't know. Sh- fuck all. Don't know a damn thing. So we get you out with a bolt gun. It needs to be a center fire gun. That's capable of a hundred yard, like on target hits. Um, it really, really more for hunters. The, the idea is to, A, go through some safety, teach them how to zero their gun at 100 yards and why they zero their gun at 100 yards, actually zero it. And then we'll do kind of a practical field exercise where I'll have them walk just a short course through the woods. They'll have to identify their target, range it, set up a shooting position, and fire a single shot into like a, a deer-sized kill zone. I like that, dude. And, and, and in my experience teaching the beginners of people that have never done anything so much more enjoyable it is yeah you don't you don't get your john wicks (laughs) you just get guys that are like dude show me what's up man yeah Yeah. all right cool well go record with uh kozak and and jordan because jordan is uh not welcome on here anytime soon (laughs) 